Well, on Wednesday this week, January 6th, the church marked the feast day of the Epiphany, as I just told the kids. And that's Epiphany with a capital E. Now, the Epiphany of our Lord is a day that celebrates the manifestation of God in Jesus Christ for all the nations. It's the day the Magi, the wise ones from Persia, that is modern day Iran, arrive at their destination after a long journey of following the star God set in the heavens to guide them. But here there's something that I want you to notice. The destination that those wise men were going to wasn't a place. Their destination, their goal, was Jesus. Because only Jesus could fulfill their heart's desire. And so Matthew the evangelist tells us that when they finally set eyes on the child who's been born king of the Jews, they are overwhelmed with joy. And they bow down to worship and offer him gifts. And our scripture also tells us, though, that not everyone is filled with joy at the news of the Savior's birth. Herod, the nominally Jewish puppet king who rules at the pleasure of Rome, is afraid because he perceives a threat to his throne and to all the privileges that go along with it. Herod doesn't seem to know the scriptures that prophesy the Messiah's birth. He's not a religious man. And so he consults others to provide him with an interpretation. But one thing he does know, his insecurity and his instinct for self-preservation tell him that he can't risk allowing this child to grow up. So he hatches a plot to have the toddler killed, and then he tells the Magi a lie to cover it up. But you and I who've heard the rest of the story know that God foils Herod's evil plan. God speaks to the Magi in a dream and warns them not to go back to Herod, but to go home by a different road. Well, this past Wednesday, January 6th, was also a day of epiphany with a small e. As our eyes were opened to the dangerous depths of division and delusion that have gripped our nation, many of us watched wide-eyed in horror as angry insurrectionists from across the United States stormed their destination, our nation's capital, where both houses of Congress had assembled to do the work of certifying the Electoral College votes. Now, in contrast to the Magi, who followed a star in the heavens, the protesters who streamed to Washington, D.C. were following a star on social media. And unlike the ones in Matthew's Gospel, the members of the mob didn't come bearing gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, which they knelt down to offer in peace. Instead, they came brandishing banners and bullhorns, handcuffs and weapons, with which they violently struck down anyone who got in their way. More than 50 police officers were injured in the riot. And one officer died Thursday night after being bludgeoned with a fire extinguisher. In addition, one rioter was fatally shot by the Capitol Police, and three other people died as a result of medical emergencies. There are still many questions to be answered, but it's gradually dawning on many of us that months of angry words spewed online have spawned this violence in and around the hallowed halls of our nation's capital. It reminds me of, um, this is the book of James that talks about how the tongue is like a fire that unleashes great destruction. And now we're hearing reports that some groups are planning still more violence in the coming days. And friends, this is just so frightening on so many levels. 
But as a Christian and as a called and ordained pastor of Christ's church, I have to say that one of the most disturbing things about all of this is the way that Jesus and God are being invoked and the way our Christian symbols are being hijacked in support of something that has nothing to do with Christ. Specifically, I'm talking about some of the faith symbols and signs that people in the crowd were carrying. There were, of course, crosses and Bibles. There were also signs declaring Jesus saves and also God, God, guns, and guts made America. Let's keep all three. And there were Jesus 2020 signs modeled after Trump 2020 campaign signs. Now, I also take issue with the slogans some folks in the crowd were spouting because both the signs in their hands and the words on their lips smack dangerously of Christian nationalism. For example, someone in the crowd would call out, shout if you love Jesus, and the people would cheer. And then the, the same leader would say, shout if you love Trump, and the people cheered even louder. My friends, this kind of Christian nationalism, which seeks to co-opt Jesus by suggesting he belongs to one particular group, is heresy, that is, false teaching. It's also incredibly dangerous because it promotes the lie that God loves our group and is on our side. And when any of us buys into this way of thinking, we end up dividing the body of Christ and adopting the harmful posture of looking down on our neighbors, of despising our neighbors, including those of other faiths. And that is clearly not the way of Jesus. It's not the way of healing and reconciliation that our Lord models for his disciples throughout the Gospels. Indeed, from Leviticus on up through Ephesians, God calls on God's people to show hospitality and care for the widow, the orphan, the hungry, and the migrant, while making every effort to, quote, keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, unquote. In short, God's word makes no allowance for hating our neighbors. Indeed, Jesus calls us to love our enemies. The Bible is clear in stating that God deeply loves the whole world and has sent Jesus Christ to invite all people into a loving, living relationship with God. Therefore, as followers of Jesus, you and I must consider our response to the misuse of our Lord's name in support of Christian nationalism. We must prayerfully ponder what we will do in response to a group of people who are intent on harming others and who invoke God's holy name in doing so. You know, a number of years ago, when our daughter Anne um, was a freshman in high school, <laughs> I sat in on a six-week parenting class, and one of the things that I found most helpful was the instructor's mantra. You can't control what other people do. You can only control how you respond. Well, not only have I found that to be true in parenting, but also in ministry and across the board in pretty much every area of life. And so I ask again, how will you and I respond to our Lord's call to be witnesses to the gospel in the challenging days that lie ahead? If we do nothing, if we sit in our armchairs and turn off the TV and try to ignore what's going on, then the false prophets and, the, and their disciples may prevail in the short term. And Christ's church will continue to decline in numbers and in vitality. But if you and I stand up and speak out boldly, if we welcome outcasts and sinners of all types and stripes in the name of Jesus, then we and many others will be blessed as the healing light of Christ reaches across borders to include all the children of God. So as we weigh our individual and our corporate response to Jesus' call to discipleship, let's take a closer look 
at the story of Jesus' baptism as told by Mark. As usual, what happens to Jesus here also serves as an example for us. When he's baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River, the heavens are torn open and the Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form like a dove. God is on the loose in Jesus. And at that very moment when the Spirit descends, Jesus hears God's voice affirming his identity. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Let's sink in for a moment. Before Jesus even does anything, God declares him beloved. And God is well pleased with him. And guess what? The same is true for you and for me. We too, before we ever do anything, are declared beloved children of God. And God is well pleased with us. That's pure grace. And yet, even though all of us know, I think, on an intellectual level that we're saved by God's grace and not by our good works. We're Lutheran after all, right? Even though we know that intellectually, I sometimes wonder whether we actually believe this in our hearts. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, friends, I've heard over the years a faithful church member say, I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy. And I just want to gently shake them and say, wake up. Yes, you are good enough and you are worthy, not because of who you are or because of anything that you've done or haven't done. You are worthy because of who God is. And you are worthy because of what God has done. God, what God has revealed to us through Jesus the Christ. And so to recap, as you and I consider our response to God's call, we must first consider who we are. Beloved children of God, with whom God is already pleased. Let's take another look at verses 10 and 11. When the Holy Spirit enters into Jesus and he hears God's voice affirming his identity, that is his preparation ministry. The baptismal assurance that he belongs to God and that he is unconditionally loved is all Jesus needs to sustain him in his mission and ministry. And the same is true for us too. Once we accept that we're accepted and we turn to God in repentance and faith, then God will help us discern our response to the words and deeds of others. During this and every other time, of great division and grave challenge. You know, way back when I was in graduate school, I once heard a sermon in which the pastor spoke about the common misperception that baptism is like an insurance policy. He said many Christians get their children baptized and then you never see them again because they view baptism as being kind of like fire insurance, that is, insurance against going to hell. But then the pastor went on to say, that's just not true. Baptism isn't an insurance policy. It's more of a recruiting contract. Think about it. Baptism doesn't get you out of anything. It gets you into everything. And the more you get into the things God calls you to do, the more dangerous it can be. Just look at what happened to Jesus and so many of his disciples. Well, you and I don't have to look very far, do we, to see how right that pastor was. I mean, if we read the verses of Mark's gospel that come right on the heels of today's text, then we see that the very same spirit that descends on Jesus like a dove suddenly goes all harpy in verse 12, and drives him out into the wilderness where he is severely tested by Satan. But that's a story for another day. 
Namely, that's a story for the first Sunday in Lent. So friends, let me leave you with this. As disciples of Jesus, you and I have been commissioned to continue his work of healing and reconciling the world. And we know this work isn't easy. God knows it too. That's why God has given us some gifts to sustain us. Thankfully, we have the gifts of scripture, prayer, and our faith community to help enlighten us. Gradually, we come to see that living out Christ's call to pursue justice, truth, and reconciliation doesn't help us to earn our way into God's good graces as if we could. On the contrary, the good works that we do in the name of Christ are a response that's born of love and gratitude for all that God has first done for us. We also have the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out on us in our baptism. The Spirit of our Lord who is always there with us and for us, giving us wisdom and strength for the journey. And so we can testify that as hard as it is to follow in the way of Jesus, we know that his way is the way of abundant life. And we know that God desires to give this life not only to us, but to all God's children of every color, every race, every nationality, every creed, every age, every political ideology, every ability, every gender identity, every sexual orientation, in every time, in every place. And so we say, thanks be to God, who names us and claims us as beloved children, and who is always with us to help and guide us as we follow Jesus on this journey that leads to true life. Amen.